Okay, so we've been talking about hydrogen NMR or proton NMR. Uh, remember, because of the spin properties, uh, the isotope of hydrogen with just a proton in it and no neutrons uh, has a magnetic moment and thus can behave like a tiny little bar magnet. And we can get some information from that uh, when we uh, irradiate it with electromagnetic radiation from the radio wave spectrum, uh, radio wave area of the spectrum. We've already talked about the fact that we see different uh, number of signals based on the number of different types of carbons. Each one of those signals and where it shows up in the spectrum uh, tells us some information about the type of proton it might be, whether or not it's attached to a, uh, groups that are near electronegative groups. Uh, we can tell how many protons we have by doing an integration of our signals. What we're going to talk about now is one of the more powerful aspects of hydrogen NMR spectroscopy, and that is this splitting pattern that occurs uh, in the signals. Now, we've already established that this is one signal, but when we look at it, we see it looks like more than one peak. And in fact, if we expand it, we see that it's three peaks. And this signal over here is actually four peaks. And if we look at this signal way over here, it's kind of complex. Uh, and that's because this is actually due to three different hydrogens. So it's not really one signal, it's actually three signals, but they happen to come very close together and the signals are split up and it becomes quite complex. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about why that occurs. So the signal splitting, the first thing we wanna learn about is this N plus one rule. A signal is affected by other protons that are near it two or three bond lengths away, okay? So if we have a carbon with hydrogens on it, which is bonded to another carbon, which are hydrogens on it, those hydrogens would be three bonds away and they can interact. And uh, because of that interaction, we say that they couple. Uh, and the number of peaks then for any given signal gives us information about those protons that are coupling, they're, they're communicating. So each neighboring nuclei on those uh, protons, they have uh, a magnetic moment, and that ag magnetic moment can either add or subtract from the applied magnetic field uh, that we're using to probe that other proton signal with. So the number of peaks observed for a signal then will be n plus one, where n is the number of non-equivalent neighboring protons. When we say non-equivalent neighboring protons, we're talking there about they're not equivalent to the proton that we're actually looking at at the moment, but the ones that couple with it uh, will, uh, if they're all equivalent, we see simple complex, we see simple splitting patterns. If the ones that are coupling with the one we're probing are not all equivalent, we can see simple or complex uh, splitting patterns. So the amount that a signal is split, we can measure it uh, in hertz and we talk about that distance as being the coupling constant between two protons. So let's explore this a little further. And let's take a look at our n plus one rule. So here we're looking at a spectrum for uh, methyl bromide, I'm sorry, ethyl bromide. And these protons right here, uh, we expect them to be furthest downfield because they're close to the electronegative group and they're right there. And if we do an expansion of this over here, we see that that signal is split into four different peaks. Now the reason that it's split into four different peaks is because it's coupling with the protons over here. There's three of them, N equals three. So three plus one equals four, which gives us our quartet. And that's why this signal right here is a quartet, okay? Now let's take a look at the other signal. That's the signal due to protons B, we see it here, and it's a triplet. Now the reason it's a triplet is because 
it is coupling these protons right here. The protons on A, and there's two of them. And in that case, N equals 2, and 2 plus 1 is 3, and we get our triplet. So this is a very uh, ubiquitous rule. We find it uh, throughout uh, NMR spectroscopy. And in fact, this signal where we see a triplet and a quartet, where we see a triplet and a quartet, uh, is very common for the ethyl group. Uh, there's some more information here. You, you don't see it just yet. But the distance between peaks here and here is the same. And that tells us that it's very likely, or very likely may, that these two are coupling with each other. If the distances between the lines were different between this signal and this signal, we would definitely know that they are not next to each other, that they're not coupling. Okay, So let's, let's take a look at that a little bit further. So the fact that this distance and this distance is the same tells us that it's very possible these signals are coupling with each other. And that's very diagnostic for an ethyl group where we see a quartet, typically further downfield, and a triplet, typically a little bit further upfield. Uh, and the coupling constants are the same uh, in terms of their magnitude. We see that for ethyl groups. Let's take a look at a slightly different molecule. So here we have uh, 1, 2, 3 propane, and we have 1, 2, 1, 1, 2 trichloropropane. So we have two chlorines on one carbon and one chlorine on the other. Now because of that, we have two different protons. We have proton A, which is by itself, uh, on one carbon and protons B and there's two of them on the other carbon. So in this case if we're looking at protons B uh, we expect it to be further upfield because it's only attached to one chlorine atom whereas if we were looking at this proton it's attached to a carbon that has two chlorines on it, so we expect it to be further uh, downfield. So let's just straighten that out. Here is our proton A. And over here is our protons B. Uh, just as we expected, and we can see the integrations as well. We can see this one integrates this one. Oops. We can see that this one integrates for 2, uh, the signal integrates for 3. So this signal B right here, sorry, right here, is split into 2 uh, because it's next to a single proton. This signal over here is split into 3 because n equals 2 and it's split into 3. Here's another pattern. Uh, again, we have a single proton, and it's on a carbon that's attached to just one, so we expect it to be further upfield. And we have two equivalent protons. They're attached to different carbons, but because of symmetry, they're, we see it right there, uh, further downfield. These ones that I have in blue are a doublet because they're split by just that red proton there, A. And A gives a triplet because it has two hydrogens next to it. So in this case, uh, N equals 2. And over here, N equals 1.
Uh, we often see this thing at zero. Remember, that's just our internal standard tetramethylsilane. Uh, we use it some, we used to always use it. Uh, modern instruments can lock without it, but we still often see that signal at zero because we have an external standard in there to make sure that our spectrometer gives us uh, the right reading in terms of uh, the parts per million axis. So a doublet occurs when we're looking at a signal that is coupled to only one proton. Now what's occurring is that that proton that it's coupling with uh, has its own magnetic field and that magnetic field can align either with the applied magnetic field or it can align against the applied magnetic field. So uh, we're looking at HA okay and the external it sees two different slightly different external applied magnetic fields this one and this one that's due to the sum of these two vectors so it gets split into two uh, one goes a little bit up field the other a little bit down field so instead of seeing this nice singlet we see this doublet and the distance between these two peaks measured in Hertz not PPMs we convert our PPMs to Hertz uh, the distance between these two is the coupling constant so this is tells us why this occurs there are two ways the neighboring proton can orient either with or against the applied magnetic field when we have two protons next to it n equals two now there's three ways that uh, our coupling protons can orient themselves with the magnetic field. They can both align with the applied magnetic field or they can both line against the magnetic field. So if they're both lined against the magnetic field we'll see a signal over here that's up field if they're both aligned with the magnetic field we'll see a signal over here that's down field there's another way they can orient themselves and they can orient themselves in fact in two different ways one can be with the externally applied field and the other against it now we can flip those two around where this proton on the bottom now aligns against the field and the other one with it because there's two states that that can occur in, we see twice the amount of signal there. And our ratio then of these peaks is uh, one to two to one. We see a one to two to one triplet. What about when n equals 3? Well, when n equals 3, uh, uh, as we saw over here with uh, ethyl bromide, uh, we've already seen the spectrum and we have the typical pattern that we have a triplet and a quartet. The reason for that is there's three ways the protons can all align with the magnetic field or the protons can all align against the magnetic field. And there's, we can have two align with, oops, we can have two align with and one against in three different ways. And we can have two align uh, against and one with three different ways. So we actually see then a one to three to three to one in terms of the, the size of those peaks for our quartet. So for splitting, there's three things that you have to think about, three rules, I suppose, for splitting. 
The equivalent protons cannot split one another because they resonate together. So if we have a molecule These protons are all equivalent. This is ethane, and this would just give us a singlet because there's only one kind. Uh, the integration would be meaningless because there's only one signal, uh, but it is due to those six uh, hydrogens all being equivalent. They don't couple. If all we do, as we've already seen, is replace one of the hydrogens with some other group, we now see a quartet for the CH2 group and a triplet for the CH3 group. And if this is electronegative, which it most often is, we expect this to be furthest downfield and these to be furthest upfield. So furthest downfield and furthest upfield. When they get too far apart, as in this instance here, they may couple, and if they do, the coupling constant will be very small, but more often than not, splitting is generally not observed when they get too far apart. The third rule, the n plus one rule, only applies to protons that are all equivalent or closely equivalent. We'll get to that in just a second. The splitting pattern observed for the proton shown below here is likely to be more complex than a simple triplet, even though uh, we have a hydrogen here and another hydrogen here. Uh, having said that, actually I'm going to make them different as well. Another hydrogen here. They're quite different. So the coupling between these two is very likely to be very different than the coupling between these two. So uh, our J the green one is not likely to be equal to the pink one. These two coupling constants are not the same. So what we would see is this, uh, this coupling constant would split them into uh, a doublet. This other coupling constant here could split them into a doublet, but they're different sizes, so we're going to see a complex pattern uh, for the splitting of that proton. When two sets of protons couple, they will become multiplets and the spacing between the lines is equal. We've already talked a little bit about this. So for our ethyl group, uh, the coupling, uh, we talk about JAB if uh, these are protons A and they couple with B with a coupling constant JAB and these protons are protons B and they couple with protons A with a coupling constant JBA, they will be equal because they're coupling with each other. So that means that the lines between them, this distance, JAB has to be the same as JBA. Uh, now just because we see them the same doesn't necessarily mean they're coupling together, but if they're different, they, they cannot be coupling together. If we have instruments with different field strengths, remember uh, we use the part per million scale because that makes the signals all appear at the same place uh, in our spectrum. But if we use more powerful instruments, uh, we see something interesting. So our 60 megahertz machine, take a look at this triplet it appears to be fairly far apart uh, and on this machine it appears narrower. They're both coming at the same place and that's because remember uh, that this parts per million scale cancels each other out and we'll see them at the same place 
but the relative distance of the splitting becomes different because uh, this distance will be 6 or 8 hertz, but 6 or 8 hertz on this instrument is very, very small indeed. Uh, so we see narrower peaks. The beauty of higher magnetic strength instruments is that they give us better resolution. So in this particular instance where we're looking at uh, the protons from uh, B and C, so these protons on B, look at that, they overlap with these protons on C. C is this nice, we expect it to be a nice singlet, and they overlap and it gets messy. But over on this one, we see the nice singlet, and furthermore, we see a nice quartet next to it uh, because this is the, a higher field instrument. Here we see the ethyl group uh, for whatever this compound in R may be something we, we, we don't know. We haven't been given the chemical shift, uh, but there's quite different. And we see a triplet and a quartet. The coupling constants are the same. We expect to see that because they're coupling with each other. Over here we see a triplet and a quartet. But the coupling constants are different, so these two peaks are not associated with each other. They are not coupling with each other. What we know from this then is that here there must be a set of two protons elsewhere. So we have to have another signal. And over here, tells us that there must be a set of hydrogens, where there's three of them elsewhere. And that's what gives us that quartet. That leads to a quartet. And these leads to a triplet. Let's take a look at another common group that we see in organic molecules. That's an isopropyl group in a molecule. We're going to do it simply by looking at a uh, isopropyl iodide. Here's our isopropyl group, three carbons attached together. Uh, the iodine is attached to the middle carbon. So we expect to see a signal for six protons. These are identical, and we see that right here. This integrates for six, and it's a doublet because it's coupling with that proton in the middle. Now we also expect to see a signal that integrates for one, and because there's one, two, three, four, five, six protons close to it, we expect that to be a septet. And if we count this, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is a septet, uh, which is exactly what we expect over here. Furthermore, it's attached to the iodine, 
So we expect it to be further downfield uh, and our methyl groups to be further upfield. So this is very indicative of a uh, septet. Take a look at this. That is, remember we had one, two, one, then we had one, three, three, one. Oops. The septet has a pattern of one to six to 15 to 20 to 15 to six to one. It's interesting. These patterns correspond to Pascal's triangle. If we go from singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, quintet, sextet, here we see Pascal's triangle. Uh, if you've taken any math, uh, you'll know those ratios. Uh, and that's what we expect to see, those types of patterns. Look at this. This would be a very rare beast, actually. A Nonet, hard to imagine how you would have a set of protons that has eight protons next to it. So I'm going to stop there just so this video is a convenient length and you can take a break and go and get uh, a drink. And uh, I'll record the rest of this lecture in just a second.